introducing uh, soon to be Dr. Erin Holmes. Um, she is wrapping up her PhD in history with us. Uh, she has a certificate in archaeology and cultural resource management. Um, she has been involved in many different aspects of the Hampton Press Management Project. Um, but the best part of her life is that she got to work for me for three years. And so, <laughs> So uh, Eric uh, uh, has been on the weekend, or was on the weekend staff of the Historic Columbia um, uh, earlier on in her academic uh, for it. And so I'm, I'm really excited that she's going to be here talking with us. And um, she's going to take a little bit of a different approach um, to what some of the other speakers have done. Um, and, and really today, um, certainly has been introducing you to the new content, but also getting you to kind of think about uh, the voices of individuals who maybe are not obviously present visually in, in the rooms in the house. And, and so that's been a big part of today, is, is thinking about children, thinking about the enslaved individuals, thinking about other aspects of the family, of the site itself, of these stories that perhaps are not so visually um, um, visually, you know, have big visual clues as you walk into these spaces, and so, um, so certainly, Erin, I think, is going to take a little bit of a different approach to show you with some of that stuff. And so, I'm really excited about what she has to say. So, Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I apologize for being a little disheveled. It's raining a little bit outside. I'm not prepared for it. Um, so today, I'm going to speak to you in a couple of different capacities. I am a social historian, which means that I study people's lives. But I come at that study from the perspective of architectural history. Buildings can communicate things to us that the documents sometimes leave out. Um, as I'm sure other speakers have noted, we don't often have documentary evidence of how enslaved people lived their lives, what their days were like, how the work they did uh, took a toll on them. And so by looking at the house from a new perspective, I'm going to try to give you some strategies to think about it in a different way, as a workspace, as a stage, as well as a home, which has been the traditional interpretation of the Hampton Press Museum. We learned a lot about the family. Um, I, as James said, I led that tour for three years, and I really enjoyed it. And so you're going to hear a lot of the things that I slipped into my tour. Um, I never told James about it. <laughs> to begin, um, this is a familiar sight to all of you, maybe not today since it's raining so much, um, but this is not what the Hampton Press Convention started off looking like. Initially, this would have been a federal style building, so um, it would have been red brick, so you have to wipe away all of that nice cream colored stucco, it would have had a small narrow front porch, and it would have had that nice classical pediment right up top. This happens most of it in the 1830s, the house is struck by lightning, and it's a convenient excuse to raise the roof and give it some cosmetic updates. But it's part of a bigger trend that's happened in the South. Um, right after the American Revolution, we see the introduction of federal architecture. And it draws a lot on the earlier styles of architecture, but it's extremely formal. It puts all of the formal rooms of the house right up front. So when you walk into this house, the plan of this house is a federal building. You walk in to that central passage, which, by the way, um, I am literally handing in the draft of my dissertation today on plantation architecture. So I've been talking about South Carolina plantations for the last week. Um, and we don't see a lot of central passages in South Carolina during the colonial period. They are mainly in Virginia. South Carolina houses, you walk into this big grand hallway. Um, or, I should say hallway because that's this passage. This grand, and this grand hall that serves a lot of different purposes. This house does have a central passage. And so in a lot of ways we can see it um, in conversation with other federal buildings, many of which are in places like Virginia. Um, they're coming out of this growing national ideology about how, how we shape Americans. But it's coming through the lens of Ainsley Hall, who is British. And so it makes sense in many ways that he would build a federal style house because he's trying to reassure his customers that he is on their side. He is in support of their goals, at least as long as they keep buying his, his. <laughs> um, 
And so when the Hamptons update the appearance of this house, they're doing something that's happening all over South Carolina. You see a lot of these Greek Revival style buildings that are designed in a lot of ways to hide the work of slavery. They have more connecting rooms. They have back stairs a lot of times, which conveniently or inconveniently you don't find in a lot of South Carolina houses um, prior to this period. Now, for me, the most striking thing whenever I walk up to this house is that there are two very large buildings missing from this landscape. Originally, it would have had a flanker building on either side, which on the one hand is something that we see at Robert Mills. At the same time, it's something that you see mostly on a plantation landscape. More often in urban settings, those buildings are going to be a little bit more hidden, and they're not going to sort of create an explicit so when is a house more than just a house? Um, how many of you have scrubbed the floor on your knees? How many of you scrubbed the floor with a bucket and a uh, brush, wax floors by hand? Okay, if you've done these things, you know how much work goes into a house like this. Imagine doing that without any kind of electrical assistance, any kind of running water really. We're still working on pumps during this time, so you're carrying buckets of water into this house and carrying them back out. Um, when you walk into the Hampton Crest Mansion, it is helpful to think of it not as somebody's home, right off the bat, at least from an interpretive perspective, but as a space where enslaved people are working on a daily basis. And these are going to be the individuals who the Hampton and Preston families come into the most contact with and whose experience of slavery shapes the way the Hamptons and Prestons think about themselves in relationship to slavery. This is why we get that narrative of the good slave master, because these families believe that they are actually treating their enslaved, keeping their enslaved people well as a whole population, largely because they show occasional kindness to the people in the house, who, because of their proximity to this family, who literally holds their lives in their hands, they can't speak against. And if they do, the, re the repercussions are going to be severe. So when you walk into this house for me, because of what I study, it's a place of work. It is a place where people live, not just the Hampton family. We know that the attic space, which is now storage, would have been sleeping space on occasion. We have documents from throughout this period that talk about how slaves are sleeping at the ends of their master's bed sometimes. They're literally on call 24 seven if they're working in this house. So this is a house that is never without slaves. And it's important to keep that in mind, even when we're thinking about it as a place where people live. Now, the final thing, is that this is a social stage. Buildings like this do not exist to make people comfortable. Um, think about walking into either of the parlors and trying to lounge on the furniture in there. <laughs> Does a settee be particularly comfortable? Um, I don't think so. Um, the production value of this house is something that is often underestimated in the literature because a lot of times we see these as the consequence of having great wealth. But for many planters, they understood that houses like this are part of the production of an identity, a social identity, a political identity. It's a way of communicating their status to other people. And in Ainsley Hall's case, we know this is a bit of a case of fake it till you make it, right? He's trying to convince the planter class that he's one of them. He marries into the planter class. He builds what is, in many ways, an old-fashioned plantation house in an urban setting. He's trying to convince them that he's part of this class. Now, he doesn't quite do it because in a lot of ways, this is an old-fashioned house, as I said before. But it does offer some cues as to how people will move through it. So, as I said before, central passages are something that we see in South Carolina architecture, but they're not common, especially in plantation buildings. Um, and urban spaces have their own interpretation, usually as kind of 
either a vested role where you're just entering the house into, or as just a passage, some place where you're not supposed to spend a lot of time. This passage, however, is large enough that you can imagine people waiting here to be shown into other rooms. You're going to have furniture on display, so this is a space to store older furniture, not furniture that's in disrepair, because of course, we're constantly thinking about appearances when you're, in, when you're inside this house. And the archway provides one really important visual cue to the way this space is delineated. Um, in many ways, this is also a large cue that this is an older house because all those formal spaces are up front. And the further back you go into the house, the more private the space is going to become, which is a way of communicating the more important the relationship is between you and the visitor. If you make it past that archway into the dining room, you are being singled out. You are being invited into a private space in the house, albeit one that is still supposed to be a formal space, a space that's on display, but it's one that not everybody is going to see. If you make it all the way into the study, then you're talking about a whole other story, because this really is a personal space. It's on the first floor, which means that people can go into it, but the degree of decoration in there is significantly less. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So who worked here? Um, as we get to the end of the 18th century, South Carolina houses have larger and larger enslaved staffs that work inside them. Um, we have a butler. We sometimes have a housekeeper. A lot of times the housekeeper is an older white woman or a family relation who needs some kind of income or needs a place to live. And so in return, she will move in with the family and oversee their daily activity. Um, oftentimes, the mistress of the house will have her own personal maid. We know that uh, Mary Canty made Mariah Walker worked inside this house alongside her brother William. So William Walker would have been the person who likely met you at the front door. And it was up to him to look at you and determine whether you were good enough to make it past that door. So think about the hierarchies that exist within the enslaved community. This is a man who is literally responsible for overseeing what happens in this house. Now, if he if it's wrong, that can have very dire consequences. And so in his relationship to the Hamptons, we see him being very protective. Um, in Diary from Dixie, in uh, Mary Chestnut's Civil War journal, she talks about William going off with the general, and at one point he's left in charge of a caravan full of valuables. And as soon as the general walks away, the thing is set upon by soldiers. And William is distraught. He can't make them stop attacking his family valuables. Um, because he does work closely with his family. He knows not just what the consequences are going to be, the hands that are going to do their things, but this has been something entrusted to him. And that relationship is something that he knows is valuable, even if it's one that is really fraught with tension. Okay. How to read a house. This is one of my favorite subjects. Um, when you walk into a building, you can immediately start determining what kind of space you're in by looking up. Um, not so much in here. That animation <laughs> is not so attractive. But if you walk into the Hampton Crest Mansion, in that front room, you find very simple molding around the top of the room because this is a space that is public but not full. The central passage, go back to that slide. Um, doesn't have the kind of really heavy embellishment around the top of the room that you would see in a space that is very formal. But because it's on the first floor, you still have to have all of those finishes done. The archway serves as one, uh, one way of communicating that, even as it's sort of creating a division between what is the public space at the front of the house and the private space at the rear. So first you look up. If you look up, in either of the front two rooms in Hampton Preston or in the dining room, you're going to find these nice little rosettes in the corner, um, in the molding. And that's going to be your visual cue that this is of a more technical term, fancier. Um, this space 
is more important. It's more formal. It's going to be on display. You are supposed to be impressed when you're in this space. And so these little rosettes are accompanied by this really detailed molding. Um, a similar but slightly simplified molding can be found in the study, but minus the rosettes. So next time you walk into the room on the first floor, look up. When you take people upstairs, you'll see that there are no moldings. Um, you can compare this to the Robert Mills house, where if you go upstairs, there are very, very simple finishes upstairs, and that's because of who Robert Mills is, which I have feelings about Robert Mills, but I'm not here to talk about this. Um, but Robert Mills wants his house to be perfectly finished, so he puts moldings on the upper floors, even though, at this point, they're not really necessary. So, first you look up. Then you look around. Where are the doors? Where are the windows? In Hampton Crescent Mansion, in those front rooms, you can walk through those triple hung windows onto that front piazza. And the use of that outdoor space is really something that is particular to South Carolina. Um, my personal theory is that it comes from Barbados, um, but that would be in the dissertation, which if you'd like to read, I'm happy to share. Or it'll be a book. Um, but it tells you, when you look around, you can tell how this room is connected to other spaces. Um, in this case, those front rooms are supposed to connect to that piazza. It's supposed to be a way of extending those formal spaces outside, which is why if you're standing on the piazza, you're also supposed to be impressed. This is a porch that has been extended specifically for this building. Remember, in this federal version, it would have had a tiny, narrow stoop that you would have walked up to. Instead, we get this grand piazza with marble and all kinds of nice wood detailing that finishes it so that it doesn't look undone. Um, where am I? So I've been talking a lot about the buildings at the front of the house. So you have to think about where this room is in position to other rooms. In this case, most of the time, if you're a visitor to the Hampton Crescent Mansion, you're going to be in the front of the house. You're not going to go further in. If you're lucky enough to be invited for dinner or to stay, then you'll see the private spaces. Um, What's missing? What do you think might be missing from those front rooms? Personal items? Personal items? A lot of personal items. Um, you also are going to see things that might be used to clean. Think about this, think about what you see in the study. Um, we've got buckets next to those cold fireplaces. Um, there are sometimes buckets in the front room, but when the Hamptons are there, you can believe that those buckets are not going to be sitting right next to the fireplace. It's a way of helping them move invisibly through a space so that the work that happens seems to happen as if by magic. You're not supposed to see or hear the enslaved people who work in this house. You're just supposed to appreciate the effect of that work. This all sort of rolls into <laughs> ideas about gracious southern hospitality. It's not supposed to look like it takes a lot of effort, right? But we all know it does take a lot of effort. And that effort in these houses is being done by enslaved people. And that's something that we cannot forget. Um, as you move through the house, you're going to encounter things like false surfacing, whale oil lamps, coal fireplaces, gas lights, bells, and fringe, all of which I will talk about. Um, so on the upper side, you've all seen these panels in the hallway. This is false surfacing. It becomes really popular um, in the 1780s and 1790s and continues to grow in popularity thereafter. You would think that you would want the, the real thing on display, right? If you can afford marble, you put marble in your house. If you can afford mahogany, you put mahogany in your house. But panels like these that have been painted to look like mahogany are actually going to be more desirable because it means that you have access to an artist who you can pay enough money to to create something. It's going to give you a degree of prestige when anybody who has enough money can go buy mahogany to put in their house. You have found an artist who is so good they can create something that looks exactly like the real thing. Um, similar things can be said about the uh, the slate fireplaces that you find in the two rear rooms. So we start seeing slate fireplaces with the introduction of coal fires because coal fires burn hotter than wood fires. And so they're going to do more damage to those nice, pretty white marble fireplace surrounds. 
slate is going to withstand the heat better. And so by being able to paint slate to look like marble, you're serving two ends. So bells have been my particular fascination of the last like three weeks because they, longer than that, but I've been writing about them for the last three weeks, so you're going to get the benefit of all of that. Um, they first start appearing in the 1740s, but nobody's really using them in any kind of great number until the 1780s and 1790s, and then after that you see them across the South. Um, places like the Aiken Red House, in Charleston have entire series of these bells spread throughout the house. Um, I just finished a research fellowship last year at Mount Vernon and bells were part of that because we see George Washington is buying, he buys I think six bells for Mount Vernon in the 1780s and they go up all around the house. Now at Mount Vernon he's putting them outside the house. The bell poles are on the inside of the house and the bells themselves are on the outside of the house communicating something about the fact that if the slave person that Washington was trying to summon was inside the house, he would just shout for him, um, more than likely. If he's outside of the house, though, and at Mount Vernon, this is likely the case because Washington was one of those people who can't stand to see anybody idle, and so if you are idle, he will find something for you to do. Um, so that bell is outside the house, so that in the event that his butler who is the man running his house, has been tasked with gardening that day, is needed inside, he can ring one of those bell poles and get him back inside. Now the fact that this bell is on the outside of the study door, what does that tell us about who is being summoned and where they might be? They're in the house. So this is someone who doesn't want to leave the study to go summon someone to come help them. That's too far to go. And it's close to the staircase. It is close to the staircase, which we will go to in just, I think, two more seconds. Um, so it's being placed in conjunction with a service space, with a circulation space, so that stair hall is going to help noise move through the house. Um, and if you notice, right next to the fireplace in the study is the little bell hole. This is where I think every single bell pull I have encountered has been. They're always right next to the fireplace, whether it's something you actually pull or in the lobby term. And so this is the space where you should be talking about slavery, where it's the easiest to talk about slavery. By focusing on the first floor, we're talking about spaces where it's a lot easier to avoid that subject when we shouldn't be. Because slavery makes this house work. At no point during this period can this house work without slavery. And so that's really something I want to emphasize here. Now, when you walk in, your eye is drawn to the staircase. Um, I have to talk about staircases, I was told by Heather, because that's what my undergraduate thesis was on, 200 years of staircases. You can Google it. Um, I wouldn't really recommend it. I was 21 when I wrote it. Um, but staircases are a lot of different things. They communicate something really important about how people move through space. They are part of that conspicuous display. We've got lots of nice, expensive wood. We've got that false surf, those false surface mahogany panels. Um, and so this, I think, this gives you another good view of it. This is something that's supposed to impress you. Um, now, a lot of houses during this period, and you can compare this to Robert Mills, we start seeing staircases go away um, because we're supposed to be hiding the work of slavery. And in a house like Hampton Preston, there's only one way to the second floor, which means that every day, every chamber pot on the second floor is coming down those stairs. This is the reason back stairs are invented in the 15th century in France, because people are tired of passing chamber pots on the way down in the morning. And so by creating a secondary staircase for that work, you don't have to see it, you don't have to smell it, more importantly, um, and you don't have to worry about the potential consequences of carrying a pot full of unmentionable stuff. Um, in this house, though, there's only one way upstairs. And so the work of the enslaved is going to be on display, and we need to think about that.
because the people who work in this house are part of the conspicuous consumption that the Hampton Preston family is putting on display. As much as any of that expensive wood, as much as the mahogany paneling. Um, and the, the uh, I don't know what it is, white.
those different identifications all shaped your experience within this house. They all determined where you could go, what you could do, and who saw you when you were inside these spaces. Um, so if you have questions about the building, I thought I would finish with Q&A, just because I know I can't answer, I can't talk to every single question you might have, so. I like the way you presented that, because I feel like now that the house is good by incorporating all the entities that share the space, that felt good. Thank you for that. That was, that's my goal, so I'm glad that worked. Um, and hopefully it worked in my dissertation, so you can come. <laughs> For your feedback, not it's not a test. And um, one of the one of the questions I'm asking is, what content do you want to do? Y'all want to learn a little bit more about? So please touch on the on the staircase or not staircase, but uh, about the extension. Um, I know with some of the new interpretation, um, one of the proposals for um, some of the capital repair work to be done is um, architects came up with a couple of different plans to um, redesign the back. Um, the space immediately behind the house to rep better represent the footprint of that addition. It would actually be a recessed garden plaza. Um, and, and so that is something that we're going to kind of 
note that addition a little bit more effectively. Um, one thing I would ask you all to keep in mind though is, is that that staircase and that little portico on the back side of the house is just completely false. That was just put on because they felt like they needed to put something on the back of the house once they tore the addition down. So there's no historical significance to that part whatsoever. Um, so, so again, we're kind of thinking about ways to better interpret the addition. <laughs> Everybody's asked. We don't ask that question, Nina. Um, <laughs> um, so, Dina, you had, just so I heard you right, you did ask the question about why was the addition tore down. A um, couple of different reasons. Um, part of it was because uh, they were trying to restore the house to a specific time period before that addition was put on. Um, I think there was also concerns about the cost of um, rehabbing that particular aspect of the house. Um, they knew I would, wouldn't have as nice of an office later on, too, if uh, they kept spending <laughs> uh, So, uh, really, they were trying to restore it back to a specific time period, but that was before the addition. That's so. good. And, and we do have blueprints of what the addition looked like right before it was torn down. And then one of the new reader rails is going to feature one of those that gives people an idea. Of course, like the blueprint from 1969 is nothing like what it would have looked like when the Prestons lived there. But I mean, it's still something. You can see that at least the size of it. And to, on top of what James was talking about with the potential uh, physical marking that shows the size of the addition, we also are working with Lambert um, Architects not only to reproduce what the facade would have looked like in 1818, but they're also hopefully doing some kind of 3D modeling that shows, physically shows those two dependencies that uh, Aaron was talking about and the addition, but it would be kind of like a 3D model flyover. So maybe not the interior, but at least really physically show where all this stuff that's not there anymore. Because we can't put up ghost structures like we did at Man Simons because it's an event space and no one wants to have their event inside a kitchen dependency yeah. white building. Yeah. But we're hoping to do, well, we're hoping to just cover it up with like a tent. Um, but we're hoping that that will give people a better idea of the stuff that's not there. A lot of that work did happen during a period when there was a different idea about how you preserve houses. And I think that's that's always been the most useful thing for me to talk about on my tours, to kind of talk about that site as a product of historic preservation work. Um, and when it was first restored, it was in a period when we said, okay, who are the great white men of history and how do we preserve their houses? And we preserved them exactly as they were. And so that house went back to when Wayne Hampton was there. Um, one note that I want to add before going back to questions is that a lot of times when you're leaving towards it, it can be difficult to have a name of an enslaved person inside the house. And that's why I emphasize so much about the work inside this house, because a lot of times this is how enslaved like, individuals experience these spaces um, through that work and the expectations related to that work. And so by thinking about that, by inserting that into your work, I think it's a lot easier to initiate discussions about slavery, um, even when you don't have a name for, in my case, and, and that's the real value of taking a tour through a historic house. Um, it's something that I try to teach with my own virtual tours when I teach classes because it's, it's we've all been inside of a house. We, this is something that is supposed to be familiar and by pointing to the things that don't fit our expectations, by pointing to the way the moldings are communicating different things about spaces, it becomes easier in some ways to complicate the way we're approaching those spaces or the way our visitors are approaching those spaces. So thank you. Other questions? Well, thank you all, and thank you for tolerating my own.